Hello, everyone, and welcome to Johnny's Ambassadors Expert Webinar Series for Teens, featuring another renowned youth speaker, Mike Donahue. Thank you so much for being here today. I am so pleased that Mike is here with us. I have a small introduction so that you can know a little more about Mike, who is the founder and director of Value Up an Omaha, Nebraska-based motivational company that focuses on positive school culture. He has spoken to over a million students throughout the last three decades in live settings. Mike has authored four books, including his latest, Value Up. He is a highly sought after speaker on respect, bullying, resiliency, and school climate issues. Mike and his wife, Rachel, live in Omaha, Nebraska, but he hails from Boston, Massachusetts, and was a member of the United States Air Force. He is the father of five children and has dedicated his life to helping students understand their own innate value and the value of other people. Mike, thank you so much for being one of Johnny's ambassadors. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. We booked this like what, four, four or five months ago, and now uh, it's finally happening. So I'm, I'm excited. Uh, I'm glad that all of you are watching today. Um, like she said, my name is Mike Donahue, and I am a speaker in, in public schools. I've been doing it for 20 years, over, to, over 20 years now that I've been uh, all around the country. Uh, I'll give you a little history of, of what how it happened. Basically, I uh, grew up in South Boston. I'm going to get to that a little bit you know, during my presentation, but I grew up in South Boston. I was uh, stationed in the Air Force um, in, in off Air Force Base in Nebraska. As a 19-year-old, I was partying and drinking, and we'll get to all that later too, but um, that I was just carousing and being being 19 and being crazy, and uh, a girl asked me to go to church with her, and so I, this is not a church talk, but uh, basically I ended up going to this church, got involved with youth ministry, uh, loved it. I uh, got involved, wanted to be a youth pastor. I was a youth pastor for um, uh, about 15 years, but the first five years I was in Rockford, Illinois. I ended up um, leaving there and going to uh, Colorado, and I was there right after the, uh, right during the Columbine uh, issue and the, the massacre. And I had uh, two of the kids that were killed in the Columbine massacre in my youth group. So Cassie Bunnell and Rachel Scott had attended Breakthrough, our youth group. And so I really uh, took that as a, as a, as a sign or, or whatever, just to, I wanted to get into schools. I wanted to get in and talk to kids. Um, I, I love doing youth group stuff, but I really wanted to talk to students in schools about substance abuse and, um, and all the different things that go with, with teenage life, uh, pressure, and uh, anxiety and um, bullying and all that kind of stuff. So that's what happened. So I, I started it thinking I was gonna do it for two, maybe two, three years and then get back into the church stuff, but I just can't help myself. I've, this is 22 years later and I'm still doing it and I love it and I've been all around the world and um, written some books and um, really got into the groove of this thing. So um, again, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you're watching right now. I'm, I'm gonna start out my presentation by doing what I do in a school. So first thing I do is I, I hold up a shoe and um, and I and I basically say this this statement, which is everybody that's in this web webinar, everybody who's you know in the in the audience right now, you have a story and your story really does matter. And when I'm in a school, I say it again because I know there's people in the room that didn't hear that, not because they were disrespecting me, but they're probably in the habit of disrespecting themselves. So what I what, what I want to get across again is that everybody has a story and your story really does matter. It's ironic that I do school assembly programs because I hated school assembly programs, um, partly because because we had weird ones. We just had the dumb, we had like, like the old, I, I'm not trying to make fun of people, but we had this old hippie guy that would come to our school and, and he was standing there. First of all, he's standing there and he's like just staring at us and we're like, okay. And then he's like swaying a little bit, you know, and, and there's no wind in the gym. So we're like, why is he swaying? And all of a sudden he like looks at us and goes, boys and girls, I did drugs. And we're like, today, like now? <laughs> like, you know, it was like that one of those deals. Or we had the drug-free puppy lady. I don't know if you've had her yet, but uh, she came to our school with puppies and little poodles and they would jump through the hoops and 
doing all these tricks and she had weird music playing. She didn't even talk to us for like the first 20 minutes. She's playing with her poodles. And then she stops, looks at us and she's like, these are drug free puppies. And we're like, wait, like are the stone ones in the van? I mean, like, I don't get that whole thing. Anyways, it was just kind of ironic. It's weird that, um, that these assemblies came and it's weird that I'm doing them now because I didn't like them. But the real reason I didn't like assemblies was not because of the weird people, though, because that guy's a side of class, but was because of this reason. When I walked into the gym and I look around, I wouldn't judge people, really. I would judge me. Like, I'd look at them and go, well, you know, their story matters, your story matters. You know, I didn't really think my story mattered. And I'm going to get into my story a little bit. Basically, I grew up in South Boston, like I said, and... I did drugs. I started doing drugs when I was in sixth grade, starting out with marijuana, uh, all the way through to my senior year in high school. And basically, if you ask me why I did drugs, I can tell you what they want me to tell you. What a lot of drug experts want me to say right this second is that I did drugs because of peer pressure. And I'm not saying that isn't some of the issues with some people. I'm just saying it wasn't my issue when it came to drugs. I was like a pharmacist. I gave drugs and I did drugs for pain. I'm not talking about broken leg pain, physical pain. I'm talking about, I have a memory of my dad leaving my family. I'm an old dude, but I still remember sitting on the front steps, watching my father, who was my hero at the time, packing the car, putting boxes, putting suitcases in the back of the car, and he left our family. He came back to the area three years later. He had a new wife. He had a new kid. He had a whole new world, and I wasn't part of that world. I don't say that for you to feel sorry for me when I'm doing this in schools. I'm not looking for, for sympathy. I just know that that day was the beginning of a bunch of really messed up stuff that happened. My mom, I'll just put it this way, I'm not trying to disrespect her, but when I look back on my mom's life, like basically she came from a long line of abuse. My great grandmother, you know, she she, uh, she abused my grandfather, my grandfather abused my mom. And when it became my mom's turn to have kids, my mom just did what she saw. That was her normal. She went with it. I'm not condoning it. I'm just saying that's what she did. And back in those days, what happened in your house stayed in your house. It was like that stupid, like unspoken rule that was like, don't tell anybody. And so a lot of bad things happened. I mean, I, I was afraid of her. I was scared of my mom. You're not supposed to be scared of your mom, right? Because your mom is usually the one giving you brownies. Like, here's a brownie, you know? And, and my mom could be like that. She was nurturing. She, she could be really a good mom at times. But then all of a sudden, some switch would flip in her head, and it would be crazy time. And, and like I said, I was scared of her. I remember being in elementary school and looking at the clock, and I hated the clock. The clock was like my enemy. Because I would look at it and 2.30 would roll around, I'd get panic attacks because I didn't want to go home. My mom had boyfriends and other adults she put in our lives that I know would go to jail today if some of that stuff happened. Again, one more time, I'm not asking anybody in this room to feel sorry for me or anybody that's watching this to feel sorry for me. I'm just saying that I know that that day, like that, that, that day was messed up. And you know what? It had nothing to do with peer pressure. My drug use had nothing to do with peer pressure. It had everything to do with the fact that I liked the way it made me feel. And I've got to be clear with you on this, okay? Because an adult just told you that they like drugs, right? I did at the time because I thought it was solving a problem. Only later I found out, obviously, that it wasn't. But that's, that's the issue. The issue is that I thought it was solving a problem. I was self-medicating. Um, I, I don't know if you know who, who Johnny Depp is. Of course you do because he's been in the news all summer. But Johnny Depp, you know, if you look up drug quotes from Johnny Depp, he, he basically said the same thing I'm saying. He said he used drugs and alcohol to, to self-medicate. And it wasn't about, it wasn't about you know, the, the pressure of it, being pressured to do it. Again, that does happen. But I'm saying that a lot of us, to, it's like self-medication. We think it's like a medicine. It's going to numb. I was addicted to being numb. I liked the feeling of not feeling. That's why when I do presentations, I will never judge. I'll never walk into a gym or an auditorium and stick my finger in anybody's face and judge them for doing drugs. I'm not condoning drug use. I don't want you to hear me say that either, but I'm just saying there are reasons people do what they do. There are reasons people do what they do. And I'm more interested in the reason. Like I say this in schools, it, I don't care really what you're doing. That's not what I'm, what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about why you're doing it. What is the reason? What got you there to this point that you think that that's gonna solve a problem? Right. Another thing that Johnny Depp said, he 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 talked about, you know, the self-medication piece. And he said it's like it's like basically um, numbing our brain and, and numbing the, the everyday life things that happen to us. Right. And so everyday life, like it's interesting that he didn't say 
tragic things, right? He didn't say, you know, if, if a tragic thing happens to you, then, you know, your obvious thing to do is to self-medicate with, with pot or with, you know, with, with X or whatever. But he said, basically, everyday life can pile up on a teenager. Everyday life can beat you up to the point where nobody knows, right? When I'm in a presentation, I ask the kids to, you know, I tell them, you know, here's why they don't know. And, I'm a, and I smile. I'm like, what am I doing right now? And they, you know, obviously they say you're smiling. Well, I ask them, how many of you in this room have learned how to smile on the outside, but you weren't smiling on the inside? You know, all their hands go up because we learned that by fifth grade, right? When like, yeah, somebody asks you how you doing, like, yeah, I'm doing good. Yeah, I want to kill you, but I'm, you know, like, they're, they're, we hide what we're really feeling. And what I say to, to, to kids a lot in the school, to students a lot in the schools, I say, you know what? You know, you need to have at least one person in your life that knows you behind the smile. Right. I mean, I get that we have to put on a show for some people, but but sometimes, you know, it's it's dangerous to me. I think it's dangerous to me when when uh, there's students that don't don't have anybody that knows them behind the smile. There's a lot can be happening behind the smile um, and we don't know it. You know, that, that term self-medication, I think it's interesting because um, I, I describe it like this. I, if I had a cut in my arm right now, it was nasty, it was infected and it needed medical attention, I could do that, right? I'd go to the hospital. But you guys know as well as I do, if I, if I let them touch that, which I'm gonna have to, to make it better, well, it's gonna hurt. Well, what if I don't want it to hurt? What if I, what if I um, you know, I could just take Tylenol for, for, and for six hours, I wouldn't even know I had a cut. It's called masking. People do it all the time. They cover up the real issue. The real issue is the cut. Tylenol does nothing for your cut. It just makes you not feel the cut. Well, the drugs and the alcohol that I was doing growing up did nothing for my cut. My dad never came back into my life. My mom never really got better. I was just with her like two weeks ago in Boston and she's not much better. I mean, it, it, it didn't solve problems. It just created more. And, it, and, it, and even when I was thinking it was numbing me, it really wasn't. I got a, a call one day from a principal. I was home watching football. It was a Sunday. I never get calls on Sundays for schools, but I got a call from a principal and he said, Hey, I need you in my school tomorrow. Uh, we had a kid that, that passed away at a party. And so I got to the school and uh, it was a big school, 2,500 kids. So they slowed up the assembly. So I, I was there all day. And they said uh, that what basically what happened to this kid was he didn't kill himself. He wasn't killed. It was sort of an accident. What happened was he got to the party. Kids were taking pills from home, putting them in a big bowl. You know how that works, right? And the kids were coming in, taking one out, putting it in their mouth, see what they did, see what it does. And this kid didn't do that. He took a handful like they were M&Ms and just took a handful and he um, had a heart attack. Whatever he took stopped his heart. And so um, I was there the whole day talking to his friends. It was just, it was, it was awful. Well, then I get a call from his mom and I'll never forget this phone call. I was on the road, I was traveling, I was in Philadelphia and I was in my hotel. She called me and she said she wanted to thank me for helping, his name is Jared, wanted to help me, uh, thank me for helping Jared's friends. And she said, um, she basically she went down the list of all the reasons why he shouldn't have done that right she's like well he's got a good home he you know he came from a good home his, he had decent grades he had a you know he was popular in the school he was on the baseball team and she went down this checklist of all these reasons why he shouldn't have done it and then she she was she got comfortable with me she she said you know i wish i would have paid attention to what he kept trying to tell me and i said what was that she goes he kept talking about the pressure and she used the word pressure she goes he kept talking about the pressure he he had on him as a high school student and she goes I, and i didn't listen to him she goes i i, I look back and i have regrets because i didn't listen because he kept saying it over and over mom i'm under pressure there's a lot of pressure and and i asked her i said why didn't you listen to him and she said because it didn't look like pressure to me and if you're an adult watching this right now you got to hear that right because it, you know we have two different worlds going on and and our world has its pressure for sure but the social pressure that young people are under is unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's way different than it was when we were in high school. And, and so that's what he was trying to convey to her and she didn't listen to him. And then she asked me the question, she goes, Mike, you work with kids. She goes, do you know what pressure he's talking about? And I said, yeah, not to be cocky or anything, but I said, yeah, but because it's the same pressure that you face every day when you walk into your school. You know by now that school's not just a school, right? I mean, if it was just a school, that'd be great. You just go in, you learn, you go home, but that's not what it is. As soon as you walk onto that campus, you're being judged. I mean, you're being judged. Your 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 shoe, your life, your 
your world. You're being judged and you're not being judged on things fairly. You're being judged on things that, that don't really matter. They seem like they matter to you now and they, they do matter to you now, but they're, they're not, they're not that critical, but it feels that way. It's like eight hours of walking down the hallway and feeling like this pressure is coming at you and it's nonstop. And I have adults one time, you know, when sometimes I do adult, you know, presentations, do parent nights after a school and they'll, the parents will come to me and they'll say, well, you know, we had pressure leaving that school. And, and I just look at them, I, t I just pick up my phone and I go, no, no, it's not the same thing. This is a TV studio. I have a TV studio in my hand. I mean, I can be doing this, this web webcast right now. I can be doing it from my phone. They gave me the option, right? Because it's, it's, it's got that capability. Well, it also has the capability of ruining your life. If, if you say the wrong thing, you do the wrong thing, and the wrong person gets that information and takes that and puts it online, that's a whole different ballgame from when I was growing up. If I, I went through social pressure when I was in high school, and I graduated with 500 kids in my class, right? So if I made a social mistake in my high school, maybe 15, 20 kids would know about it, the wrestling team, their girlfriends, whatever. The next day, nobody would care. I just did a school in Iowa two days ago, right? They had 38 in their class, in their senior class. That senior class of 38 has more social pressure than I ever did. 38 compared to 500, because the capability of getting that information out is way different now. It's obviously way different. And so when people are under pressure, they do what Johnny Depp said, right? They, they self-medicate. And I, I call it reaching for the bottom shelf. He calls it self-medication, that's fine. But that's what they do. And, and that's what we've got to pay attention to. That's, that's, again, that's a lot of the reasons why, you know, I get interviewed a lot on, on drug stuff. And people say, why do you think we have, you know, such a, a big drug culture, you know, today with all the, the stuff that's going on, the opioids and, and stuff back east and all that. And I said, well, no offense, but we have a drug culture because we have a pain and pressure culture. We, we got to look at that first. There's a, there's a belief before there's a behavior, right? If, if there's a, if there's a belief that, that, you know, I've got to put on a show, I've got to act, you know, like everybody wants me to, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to jump through this hoop, I got to, you know, post this, I got to get these, this group to like me, I got to get my coaches to like me, I get all this, all this stuff coming at me, that can be a lot. And when, again, when people are in the pain and pressure, they want it to stop, so they self-medicate. And I don't think it's just drugs and alcohol, I know this is a, a, a drug webinar, but I think there's other things too. Um, when I first started doing this 22 years ago, I was not prepared, to, I'll be honest with you, I was not prepared for the amount of kids that would come to me and talk about cutting. I mean, I got one or two in my youth group over the years, but I mean, it was nonstop, and it still is. It's still nonstop. There's more help for it today in the schools because I think they got barraged too. I mean, nobody saw that coming, right? It was like hundreds of kids you know, were coming to me, and I remember the first time it happened to me, I was in Montana, and a girl came up to me, and she gave me a, her, a cloth, she just handed me a cloth at the end of the assembly, and she said, she goes, Mike, would you help me stop cutting, she asked me that, and I, I just looked at her, and I said, yeah, I, I'll try, but I have a question for you, um, why does pain take away pain, because I don't get cutting, and the best explanation that I've ever got on cutting was from her um, basically she said as I take an emotional pain and it turns it into physical pain because I can control the emotion that I can control the physical pain I can't control the emotional pain that makes sense to me like I, I I'm not a cutter and I, I I just don't that's not the area that I struggle with but I get it like when people are under pain or pressure they want to stop they think it's going to they choose those those unhealthy uh, antidotes basically drugs cutting i also think that you know relationships can be self-medication not all of them obviously I mean, i'm not one of those adults that thinks you can't be in love as a teenager i think you can but i've also you know i've watched it good i've watched it you know i was a youth pastor and i watched kids meet in the youth group i've got friends of mine that to this day that met in our youth group and they're married now and we've got kids and all that that's great that's awesome that that's healthy that's good right but then there's the unhealthy there's the, I don't like me, so I'm gonna date somebody to like me, so if that person likes me, maybe I'll end up liking me. That's a recipe for getting used. Like that's not a good, healthy way to look at dating. That's a self-medication technique if I've ever saw one, right? I remember 
one time I was at a, a school in Iowa and a girl came up to me and well, she was standing next to me at the end of the assembly. And she said, I know, I know the guy that I'm dating right now. She goes, I know he's using. Me. And I just looked at her. I'm like, break up with him. Like, if you know that, like break up, he's no, he's not worth it. Get out of there. And she just looked at me and she goes, she goes, I would rather hear I, I love you fake than not hear it at all. Let me say that again. She goes, I would rather hear I love you fake than not hear it at all. I'm like, what do you mean by that? She goes, I don't go home to a nice loving family where I'm told I'm loved and I'm cared about. She goes, I go home to a mess. She goes, yeah, I know he's playing me. But she goes, what's my alternative not to hear I love you? Let me say that again. What's my alternative not to hear I love you? There isn't a person that's watching this right now that doesn't want to feel like you matter to somebody, right? I mean, we all want to matter, right? We, we, and when you, when you matter to somebody and you know you do, it feels great. And by the way, if, if you have to do something to matter, you probably don't matter, right? If you got to jump through hoops and you got you to please this person all the time to matter, really mattering, really having value with somebody is, is the fact that they love you no matter what. They love you because, because you're alive, right? I have that feeling right now. My wife loves me. I know she does. And, and she is, my wife's pretty. I have a pretty wife. I'll just be honest with you. I've, I've got a really, uh, I'm lucky. I'm a lucky guy, right? And, it's, and when I'm in a school, I'll show a picture of her. And usually get like a couple of guys hooting and hollering and then I have to kill them. No, I'm just kidding. But no, but they, but you know, I, I'm lucky, right? And, and, and it's awesome. It's a great feeling. But the, here, here's the thing is even though I'm saying that I'm kind of being funny, the reality is there's people watching this right now that you don't have that feeling right now. You don't get the feeling that, and I'm not just talking about romance. I'm talking about some of you, this summer's been hell because you've been home, stuck in a house with people that really don't care about you. And let's just be honest. I'm, I'm a real speaker. I don't talk fluff. This is the real stuff. I know that's going to happen because I know these are the conversations I'm going to have this year when I'm doing schools with kids that had a, a bad summer because they were stuck in a home with, with a, a dysfunctional situation where they weren't feeling like they were loved. But here's what you got to know. You're valuable. You really are. You're incredibly valuable. And, and the bottom line is that People look for love in the wrong places sometimes because they can't find it in the right places. And that's self-medication, right? They're looking for love in the wrong places. Does that mean they're, they're, they're a whore, they're a slut, they're a, you know, whatever label you want to throw on that? You, you can't do that because there are reasons people do what they do. I'm not condoning it. I'm just saying, let's look at it. It's probably self-medication. It's probably a root there that needs to get met, right? They got to feel like they're valuable. That's why we started doing schools we get brought in for different things that we say you know could you come in and talk about vaping could you come in and talk about marijuana could you come in and talk about you know bullying could you come in and talk about you know sexual stuff and and all all, all that stuff right and and they like to put it in categories and say this is what it is like we need you to talk about this situation these you know these teens are getting into this i i maybe i'm gonna sound dumb when i say this but i really believe it's not a your school doesn't have a drug problem or a bullying problem or a you know sexual promiscuous problem, whatever. It, it it's a it's a value issue. When people don't feel valued, they don't act valuable. They don't act, but they, they make choices based on what they feel about themselves, right? And 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 here's the biggest thing about value is if you keep looking for it on the outside, that's why you're getting messed up. Your value has nothing, I'm not gonna get religious here, but your value has nothing to do with outside sources, right? Because if that's true, I'm in a mess because my, my outside sources from the time I was born were dysfunctional and, and not healthy. So does that mean I wasn't valuable? No, I was valuable. I just didn't know it because I wasn't re, it wasn't reinforced. It wasn't taught to me. It wasn't nurtured into me. And so I was looking for it outside. I kept looking for it in girlfriends and marijuana and and different and bullying i believe i mean i was i was looking for power so i i tried to use use those things to be, to be powerful right and bottom line was it was a value issue when i began to see that i had value drugs went away bullying went away all the stuff went away because i realized how valuable it was and i i'm going to give you an example i was at a i was in my office one day and a girl walked in and and she was a newer girl, probably 19. And and I there was a bunch of people in my office. And so 
we all stand in there and she just arbitrarily says that she says she said why do i attract bad guys so apparently she just broke up with a boyfriend and she had had four or five boyfriends in a row that treated her terribly and she said um, why do i keep attracting these bad guys and i thought in my head she's on the right track right but my friends in the room kind of hijacked the situation and they 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 lied to her not on purpose but they were trying to be nice right so they said no oh, no it's not you you know someday you'll meet the right guy some you know you'll meet prince charming stop this for a minute okay what they were saying to her listen to what they were saying to her they were saying you're not valuable until you find the right guy you find the right party you find the right person that's going to make you feel valuable i stopped him and i said no nope. i said listen the guy is not the issue there's plenty of bad guys and girls. There's plenty of weird people out there, right? They're going to use you. That's not the issue. That's true, but it's not the issue. The issue is you. You don't know how valuable you are. So you keep accepting this life, this this prototype of this person that that is you think is going to show you how valuable you are. No, you got to find it inside yourself. You're the issue. He's not the issue. You're the issue. And, and the, here's the thing, is some of you, this is flying over your head because you're like, well, I get that nurtured into me. You know, my parents are not perfect, but they love me and, I, and, I, and I'm set up to win here and, and things are good. And that's great. I'm, I'm really proud of you. That's great. I mean, I'm not saying that facetiously. I mean that. I mean, I want my kids to say it, right? So, but here's the thing. There are people in your school. There are people in your life. There are people right now that you probably are, are really good friends with that have to fight for their value. They've got to fight for it. They, they, they need to fight for value. I had to fight for it. I had it. I just had to fight for the perception of it. It was being blocked. It wasn't being nurtured into me. So I had to fight to find it. And that's what my life has been about. It's been about this fight to try to find my value, to find this, to, to see where I'm, I'm valuable, right? To see, and, and, and I am. I was valuable back when I was 17. I just didn't know it. And now I do know it and it's changed my life. And that's that's my mission in life. That's my mission is to help people see that that they have this value that, that can't be taken from them. It can only be surrendered. You can't lose it, you can't, it can't be stolen, it, it can't it, it can't be abused enough to go away. It is yours. The the only thing is you can surrender it. And if you surrender it, then then you're in trouble because um, because people will treat you. Like, they, like they, you don't have value. They'll treat you that way. They're following your lead. By the way, your friends are following your lead when it comes to your value. If you value yourself, they'll value you. If you don't value yourself, you'll attract people who are going to use you because they know they can. We offer the book Value Up. We don't sell it to, to teenagers. I, I won't do that. I can't. I tried a couple times, and I, I just felt so horrible about it that I, I stopped doing that. And so I... I would give it away. So you can go to our website and go to the student section. Our website is www.value-up.org. You're gonna get all this information, but, um, and go to the student section, you'll see a free download uh, to the book. We have other resources I'll tell you about later, but but bottom line is you, you, you gotta fight for your value. You have to fight for your value. I gotta tell you a story. I This is interesting. Um, I love the game Two Truths and a Lie because um, there's one truth about me that you would not think, um, but it's true, and I get to stump everybody when I play this game. Uh, one of the truths about me is that I was on American Idol. I wasn't uh, a participant, but I definitely was on the show. And here's how it happened. And this illustrates my point of of somebody when they when they figure out that they have value, they their lives change. So I was I was doing a school in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And I was, and it was a good school. It was going well. Everything was great. Um, the kids were liking it. I have jokes for for kids who struggle with drug use and stuff. I, just because I want them to like me, so there's some certain jokes I tell that um, the drug free puppy one's one of them. They laugh at that. I don't know why. But and we used to sell shirts that had the drug free puppy going through it, the going through the hoop, and we sold tons of those. And mostly the kids that that were struggling with drug use would buy those. But anyways. Um, but I was, so I had, I had a bunch of jokes and I had this group of kids right up on the right hand side and they were losing it. They were having a good time. Well, this girl comes down as I, after I was done and she stands this close, like she got really close to my face and she goes, hi. And I go, hey, 
And she goes, I really loved your assembly. And I said, thank you. And then she said, but I'm still gonna smoke pot, right? So I guess as the speaker, I could have been offended by that, right? Like I could have been like, well, you know, uh, double down on my message with her and say, you know, marijuana has got, you know, whatever, and, and, and preach at her about marijuana. But I already know this about, about her. I don't know her, but I know this about her, that two things, she has a story and she has a dream. Her story got her to where she is right now. Her dream is going to get her to where where she can go if she pursues it and goes after it. But well, we got to figure out the story first. We got to find out what happened. So I I that's exactly what I went with. I didn't give her preach at her and and you know go through my message again. I just said, "What's your name?" She said, "Rose." And I said, "Rose, um, tell me a story." And so we, I stood there in the gym with her for 20 minutes, and she was going on and on about her parents. One, one, both of them died before she was 15. One was a drug overdose. One was a drunk driving accident. And she's been couch hopping with parent, you know, with relatives that didn't really want her. She was a senior, and and she had me crying. I mean, she was going through all these things, and she wasn't trying to get me to cry, but just a tragic story, you know, of of what what she went through. And I, th I thought in my head, no, no wonder she's self-medicating. Right. And, when, and I'm not, again, I'm not condoning it. I'm just saying I get it. Like, of course, you're doing something to make this pain and loneliness and fear and, and tragedy and, you know, PTSD, probably. I mean, you, you're you're trying to cope with, with life. And so she's doing this. So then I said, Rose, um, what's your dream? And I love asking that question. I just love asking that question one on one because they never hesitate. I mean, hardly anybody ever goes, I don't know. I mean, sometimes they do, but but if you really get them, you know, you, you, they, if they know you're interested in, in the real answer, you're not just asking the question, but you really wanna know, they go at it. I mean, this girl just went off. She was, for, you know, 10, 15 minutes, talking about wanting to sing, and wanting to do this, and wanting to change the world. She started giving me, you know, her worldview and what she thinks of the world, and it was just precious, you know? And so I gave her a copy of my book, and I hugged her, and I said, I said, Rose, you know, don't give up on this. Like, fight for your dream. Fight for who you are. You know, and I didn't say anything about drugs. And I want to make that clear. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. I just said, I just encouraged her. And I gave her the book. And I said, just, just do, you know, do you. Be you. So this happens all the time. So I, I get to hug them and leave. And then I'm gone. I never see them again. Well, this girl calls me a year later. I get this phone call. I swear to God. All of a sudden, I pick up the phone. I know it's a business line call. So I go, uh, value up this is mike and she goes hey <laughs> and and she goes i my name is rose you probably don't know me and she got through you know all the pleasantries and stuff and she said i just wanted this was exactly what she said she goes i just want to let you know that i'm going for my dream and i'm off drugs and you helped me get off drugs thank you so much and i just wanted to say thank you and i was blown away and then i said what's your dream what are you doing she goes well i'm singing I said, and I'm like, oh, a church or something? She goes, no. She goes, I was on American Idol. And I'm like, American Idol, American Idol? And she's like, yeah. And I, if, I'm going to be honest. At first, I was like, I wonder if she's really on American Idol or she's just kind of, you know, maybe she was having a good night that night. But no, I'm just kidding. But bottom line is I didn't know. I didn't know if she was, if she was lying up. So come find out she was on American Idol. And she actually made it to Hollywood. And they did a backstory on her. And they went up to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and they they filmed their friends and her, and her brother and, and, and the people that she was living with now. And it was a huge story. And I want to come back to something she said that probably wasn't really accurate, um, but it was. She said, you helped me get off drugs. But I didn't directly say anything about drugs. I talked to her about her dream, about who she is, and, and, what, and, and what the essence of who she is, that top shelf, right? The drugs and the alcohol, all that stuff's on the bottom shelf. But what's on your top shelf? What what's up there? Because you you have to reach for that. Nobody's gonna hand that to you, right? You you have to go after that with everything you have, and that's what I was telling her. Is is you get it? You know, Rose, that's easy. You can you can easily go for that, but this is harder, and you got to get people around you. And I didn't know. You never know if the people that you're talking to are gonna take what you say seriously and, and do something with it. But she did. She went off and she she made something of her life and then she tried out the next year and I went with her and I 
actually shook Ryan Seacrest's hand for a minute and a half. I had to stay camera ready with him because she was in trying out and she had to come out whether she made it or not. And, and she made it again. And so it was a big, it was great. It was an awesome experience for me. I'll be honest with you. And I get to win all those games, you know, two, two, so on. But, um, but bottom line is I want you to hear that when people figure out that they have value, they make choices based on that value, right? If you think on a scale of one to 10, you think you're a two, you're going to make two choices. You're going to make two choices with friends, with drugs, with, you know, poison your body. You're not going to care, right? That's what I didn't like about the assemblies when I was a kid. When they came in and said, don't do drugs, I was like, why not? Like, really, honestly, I'm not trying to be facetious. Why not? Tell me why. Because I don't really care that they're bad for me because I don't really care about me. So make me care about me. Make me see that 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 this is a good choice for me, that that I have value. And then maybe maybe I'll I'll stop doing those things. And so that's a big thing. That's a big part of my life. It's a big part uh, of people that I'm coaching personally. When I'm speaking in a school, I'm trying to get to their dream. I'm trying to get to what matters to them. And you watching this right now, if you were in my audience and you were sitting in bleachers or in the auditorium, I would ask you to raise your hand. I'd say, how many in this room, this is what I do in a school, how many of you in this room have a dream? And you know, watch and, and I wait and I wait to see who's raising their hand and who's raising it slow. Because that's important. Because there are some people that raise it, they don't raise it at all, and some people raise it slow. And I think it's for two reasons. One, because, because life has pain, right? We, we know life has pain. And, and that's a reality. Like when, when you have pain in your life, it's hard to go for your dream, right? And, and what's the sad thing about my job is I have really great things about my job. I love my job. I love that I get to do what I do. But there's the sad part is that, that seeing that there's so much pain. You know, I, I'm a, I'm a, I have a front row seat to it, right? Because I'm doing this. So even some of you that are watching this right now, I might have triggered some things with you. I might have got you to think about some things you haven't thought about for a really long time. And I'm not making apologies for that because if you if you bury that and if you you cover that up, you, it's 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 going to end up getting worse, right? You know that. I don't have to tell you that. You you already know that. And so that's what I do in the school. And when there's so much pain in, a, in, a, in an auditorium or in a gym and I can feel it, um, th th no wonder people are self-medicating. And the second thing is um, that, that, you know, the people aren't reaching for their dream. And the second thing is that, that not everybody gets to their dream. And that's the saddest thing that Mike Donahue says in an in a, in assembly. To be honest with you, it really is because when you don't go for your dream, when you, you, when you, when you don't think you can, you, you take your hand off the top shelf, but watch this. I don't know if you can see this or not, but when you take your hand off the top shelf, it doesn't go in your pocket, right? It goes on the bottom shelf. That's why I don't really even ask my own kids if they're doing drugs. I, I don't have to. I talk about their their dreams, right? All five of my kids, I know what their dreams are. And, and, I, and I can tell when, if they stop pursuing them, I'm not saying they run right to marijuana, or they run right to cutting, or they run right to, alcohol i'm not saying that but but it starts that slippery slope of i don't think my life matters so yeah well here's something that could give me a boost right and so that's what i, I I'm, I'm big on is is again reaching for that going for that dream reaching for your top shelf and, and going after it as as hard as you can i'm going to tell you a um a story and then we're going to close we're coming to a close here but um so I, I, I've got a shoe here of uh, a girl named Mandy. And um, I'll never forget this girl because uh, it wasn't an assembly program that I met her. I actually met her because her parents knew we were working with schools and, and that kind of thing. And, um, and they wanted to help her, their daughter, but let me back up. When she was in high school, Mandy was, was a drug-free person. She, um, never touched drugs or alcohol. She was an athlete. She was. She got a, a scholarship to a D1 college to play tennis. She was uh, a good kid. Everybody liked her. Um, popular in school. Um, I didn't know her in high school because um, it just she just didn't come across my path. But she went down to college and um, within about two months went off the deep end. Just 
drugs, alcohol, sex with everybody. I mean, just lost it, right? So her parents thinking that it's probably something to do with, you know, leaving home and, and that adjustment not being uh, solid. They pulled her, well, she was already kicked out, but they got her home and they took her to psychiatrists and they took her to all these counselors and, and you know, nothing, nothing worked. So then they found out about us and they took her to us. Now, listen, I'm not a mental health professional. I'm not a psychiatrist. You probably don't want me in your head because I'll probably mess you up worse. But, um, but I do, there is something that I do well. And, and I, 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 I take pride in this. I, I know how to be somebody's friend on their worst day. Like if you're my friend on my best day, you're really basically part of my fan club, right? So congratulations, you made the fan club. But when you're, when you're my friend on my worst day, then you're in my circle, right? You, you're in the crap with me. And, and you're the person that, that I can, I, you know me behind my smile. And, and it's rare, it's rare and, and I've got them now. And, and partly because I know how to do it with people. And so when Mandy came onto our team, that's what we did. We took her onto our school team, our school summit team. And she didn't do much. She was just helping us you know, bring stuff in at first. But we just, her parents wanted her to get around positive teens. And I had teens with me doing the assemblies uh, back years ago. So what happened was we just, I, I made it my mission to try to be her friend. And she came stoned. She, she smoked pot right out in her car. We could see smoke coming up the windows before she came into the into the building and before we were prepping to go on a trip and you know it was, it was one of those things where I could have got offended I guess and and again I, I know there's a story but she's not going to tell me because right now she doesn't know me I'm a stranger I'm I'm nobody right I'm just another person trying to I'm like the the character on you know the Charlie Brown rah, 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 you know the parents that's all she hears when I talk so I'm not going to say anything to her so, you know, it's friendly to her and, you know, nice and stuff. But then as we kept going, I kept trying to make her laugh and do certain things. I got her involved in some things that she could get involved in. And I could tell she started to like me. Not in a weird way, but like I mean, she started to trust me. And so uh, we were coming back from a trip and we were in, in Wisconsin. And we stopped off at, at Wendy's to get something to eat. And I pulled her aside. I said, I said, Mandy, come here. Sit with me for a minute. So she sat across me in this booth. I'll never forget this as long ago. I said, man, I think she, I think she thought that I was going to ask her why she smokes pot, right? And so I didn't do that though. I, I asked her this. I said, Mandy, um, why did you walk away from your dream? And right away, her eyes welled up. I mean, right away. She goes, what do you mean? And I go, well, the guys you're with, they're like they're using you, right? You know that, right? She's like, yeah. I go, that's not your dream. That's not your dream. And then I said, and the drug, you know, drugs and the, and the pot, and you're athlete, you're you're poisoning your body. Like you, this is not your dream. I said, I just want to know the day you decided this wasn't your, that that this wasn't your dream anymore. That that you know, living, you know, doing tennis and and living healthy was not your dream anymore. She goes, do you, this is exactly what she said. She goes, do you want the real answer? Or do you want the answer I gave everybody? And I said, I want the real answer. She goes, well, it's not for you. And it wasn't. I'm not going to say everything that she said in this, okay? But um, she said um, basically that her brother, when her brother was, um, um, let me back up. When she was 11 years old, her brother brought his friends home. And they were, you know, goofing around. She goes, these kids would get guys I knew. They weren't strangers. I, I've known these kids all my life. But she was getting older. She was developing. And these guys didn't see her anymore as a little girl. And it just got out of control. And everything happened. The whole thing happened. I'm not going to say it. But you know, it, it happened. And I said to her, I said, Mandy, because she said, you're the, first, you're the first adult that's ever heard this. And I said, why am I the first adult ever hearing this? Why didn't you tell somebody? He said, because I didn't want to get my brother in trouble. I said, well, okay, but I said, what did you do? She goes, I went down in my room. I took the longest shower of my life. And then I, I uh, she goes, I took all my Barbie dolls, all my stuffed animals, and I put them in a box, and I put them up in my closet. 
And I said, why did you do that? She goes, because I grew up that day. She goes, I became an adult that day. I became an adult that day. When I tell this story in schools, I look right at those kids and I say, let me ask you a question, okay? Let's just be honest. If Mandy was new in your school today and you knew two things about her, you knew she was on drugs, you knew she was smoking weed, and you knew that she was with a lot of boys, how many of you in the school would be honest and say by, by noon she's going to have a bad reputation in the school? And obviously the hands go up. And I said, okay, well, let me, let me flip it for you now. Let me ask you this question. Let's say we're not taking the temperature of the room to figure out what we're going to think about this girl. Let's say you're me. You're at, you're at Wendy's and you're sitting there in the, in the booth and she's telling you this story and there's tears streaming down her face and you're looking at this girl and she's telling you this story. I just have to ask you. I asked the school this. I ask them, I say, how many of you in this room would care, would really care? And obviously their, you know, their hands go up. And, and, I, and sometimes there's this grown, like teenage boys, tough teenage boys with tears coming down their face. Because they have sisters, right? And they have moms. And so honestly, when, what I'm trying to say is she goes to your school, right? These stories I'm telling, these people, they go to your school. They do. They go to your school. They have stories. They have stories that got them to where they are now. So we can call them names if you want. You call the girl a slut. You can call the guy a loser or, you know, whatever. You, you can slap that label on them if you want. I just can't do that because I know that there's a story behind it, right? And, and, and to close this out, I got to tell you a big part of mine was the day – I got in a fight with my mom, the worst day of my life. I was a sophomore in high school. My mom and I got in a fight and she was hitting me with a stick. And we had all kinds of problems with my mom and I just fighting and, and just, it wasn't healthy. It wasn't good. It was, it was, it's a, there's a lot that goes into it, but I grabbed the stick. And when I grabbed it, I didn't realize that she had placed a knife next to it. So it, it cut my hand. Well, if I stopped the story right now and I told you that was the end of the story, that's still a pretty messed up story. But it didn't end. The stick hits the ground. I'm looking at my hand because it's bleeding. And the next thing I know, here comes a knife. And she tried to put it through my head. I have 17 stitches on my wrist right here, blocking the knife from going through my head. If I hadn't lifted my arm in that moment, I would not be standing here. Right now. And to be honest with you, that was not the worst day of my life. That wasn't. The next day was. Because the next day I had to walk into my school and pretend that didn't happen. Some of you that are watching this right now, you can totally relate to that, right? You can totally relate. Maybe you can't relate to a knife fight. And by the way, don't scale your pain. Don't say, well, Mike gets to feel his pain because his mom did that. But I, you know, I don't because my dad and mom get divorced. Don't, don't scale it. Don't, don't do that. Because everybody's pain, everybody's experience, everybody's story is valid. You have the right to feel it. But, but you know, some of you, in this, some of you that are watching this right now know what it's like to walk into your school and put on a show and act like everything's okay. And it's not me inside. And that's why I do this. Because that day is a liar. That day lies to you. It tells you to give up. It tells you to quit. It tells you that you're not worthy. It tells you, it mocks your dream. It's a stinking liar. But it's only one day. And the, and the big dupe is that that it's gonna last forever. It doesn't, that day was not a good day. I'll be honest, it sucked, but it, it was one day. When there's been days like it after that, sure, but there's been a lot of good days and there's good people in my life and there's people that wanna show me that I'm valuable and they're, they're out there and you can't give up, you can't give up. Please don't give up. When I'm in the school and I tell that story about my mom, I, I asked the kids, I said, will you do me a favor? Will you please just look at me and, and just tell me that you're not going to give up. Don't give up on that day. Don't give up on that day. And to close, to cl I keep saying I'm going to close it, but to close it, I, I, I pick up a, a shoe that I have. It's a boot. And I tell this story that, I, that happened to me because I said that in the school. I said, don't give up. And I was in Pea Ridge, Arkansas. And a girl came up to me. At the, it was the second time I was there. And she came up to me and she, she handed me a boot and she said, I, I, there's a note inside. I can't talk to you now as I got practice. She goes, but read the note. 
So she left and I took the, the boot and I went like that to get the, the, the note out and a bullet fell out. And I was like, oh, wow. And I read the note and the note said, you came to my school when I was a freshman. She goes, you didn't know this, but that was the worst day of my life. And I was going home that day and I told myself if something didn't happen to school today, I'm gonna take my life. And you stood up and you said to that, to our school, those days suck. And it was, it was a bad day. She said, but I heard you say, don't give up on that day. And so I decided to go to my counselor and she was having, a, I'm not gonna say what was going on. It was a pretty rough situation. She said um, that she went and got help from her counselor. And, and she goes, I wanted to give you the bullet that was supposed to go through my head that day. Listen, I'm not saying that for you to pat me on the back. I'm not saying that for you to like me or bring me into your school. I'm saying that because that's what's going on today. There's so much pressure, there's so much pain, there's so much junk. And when kids don't feel like they know what to do with it, they make bad decisions. I don't know why I'm such a cry right now, but but that's that's what we gotta do. We 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 I I am so excited about Johnny's ambassadors because something for somebody like that to take a, a tragedy, a pain in their life and giving it purpose by doing this and, and spreading the news of, of you know value and and um, and all that. That's just amazing. And I'm just proud of what you guys are doing. And um, I'm glad I got to be with you tonight. And um, yeah, we'll give you some more information to get a hold of me. But um, thank you so much for your time and, and hang in there and don't give up. Keep going, fight, fight, fight. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, I really needed to hear a lot of that tonight and I'm sure everybody else did too. And yes, I always say, uh, forge ahead, despite your pain and give meaning to your loss. And um, that's what we're trying to do here at Johnny's Ambassadors and what, and what you're doing. And I wanna just thank you for encouraging us to, um, to reach for our dreams. And um, you know, the top shelf, I really love that analogy. And, teaching us and reminding us all of the value that uh, that we have if if someone wants to reach out to you mike can they do that what's the best way to contact you they can email me at mike d mike d is in donahue at value dash up.org and that's my and email so that's address. your website value dash up.org yep and we'll have a new i'm putting a website together right now it's not done yet but you can go on it because it has a page on there but it's mike Donahue.co, co, not com, but co. So Mike Donahue.co, and that'll have that'll, that's going to have a lot of information on it. It's going to have some resources. Um, we have a book for cutters. We have a book for parents. Um, and so yeah, there's there's going to be some resources on that website coming up in a month. That will be up uh, by September 15th. Wonderful. Well, thanks for sharing that. Thanks to all of you for being us uh, with us here at uh, Johnny's Ambassadors. And Mike, a big thanks again for the gift of your time and talent for our nonprofit and uh, helping us with our mission to avoid a substance abuse by teens. So thanks again for being here, everyone. Talk to you soon. Bye, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.